Good afternoon and welcome. It's lovely to see everyone. I'm Ann Collins Goodyear, co-director with my husband Frank of the Bowdoin College Museum of Art. And we are thrilled to welcome you this afternoon to a very special discussion featuring the perspectives of three Bowdoin alumni leaders in the arts, Brian Ferrizo of the class of 1988 and director of the Portland Art Museum in Portland, Oregon, Shelley Langdale of the class of 1985, curator and head of modern prints and drawings at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC, and Andrew Walker of the class of 1987, director of the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art in Fort Worth, Texas. Artist Sean Leonardo of the class of 2001 is unable to join us this evening, but is certainly here with us in spirit. As many members of the audience are already aware, 2019 marks the 125th anniversary of the Walker Art Building, which opened in 1894. Underwritten by Harriet S Sarah Walker and her sister, Mary Sophia Walker, in honor of their uncle, Theophilus Wheeler Walker, a dedicated Bowdoin trustee, the Walker Art Building, designed by Charles Fullen McKim of McKim, Mead and White, represented an acknowledgement of the important role that the arts had already played for almost a century on campus. Indeed, thanks to a generous bequest from the college's founder, James Bowden III, important artwork arrived on campus in 1813. This donation made the college the first institution in the country to house a collection of drawings. And Bowden's paintings were rapidly installed at Massachusetts Hall in the 18-teens. As the college's holdings of art grew, they would eventually be moved to the chapel. The creation of the Walker Art Building represented an important milestone, providing, as it did, the first dedicated building on campus specifically for the arts. Through their generosity, the Walker sisters ensured, through the bronze inscription they commissioned for the museum's rotunda, that the building would forever be dedicated and this is their phrase, to art purposes. Since arriving on campus in 2013, Frank and I have strived to rise to the challenge set over a century ago by the Walker sisters by consistently asking us ourselves and talking with our staff and colleagues and students here at the, at the college about just what constitutes an art purpose. The major exhibition now on view featuring important new acquisitions for the collection, Art Purposes, Lessons for the Liberal Arts, seeks to shed light on just how the arts may illuminate the study of many diverse fields. Today, we have asked Brian, Shelley, and Andrew, each of whom plays a national leading role in the arts, to reflect upon the purpose of the arts in their own educational and professional endeavors. In a moment, you will hear from each of them in turn. Following their short presentations, we'll have an opportunity for a panel discussion, and we look forward to hearing from you. Before they share their thoughts, let me provide a few introductory remarks for each of them. Brian Fariso is the Marilyn H. and Dr. Robert B. Pamplin, Jr., director of the Portland Art Museum, a position he has held since 2006. He served in 2016 as the president of the Association of Art Museum Directors. He is the recipient of the 2012 Excellency Award from the Foundation for Italian Art and Culture and is a trustee of the American Federation of Arts. Prior to joining the Portland Art Museum, Brian served as the, executive, as the executive director, CEO, and president of the Philbrook Museum of Art. He holds a BA in economics from Bowdoin College, an MA from arts administration, an, an MA in arts administration from New York University, 
and an MA in art history from the University of Chicago. Shelley Langdale, curator and head of modern prints and drawings at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, DC, also serves as president of the Print Council of America. She previously served as the Park Family Associate Curator of Prints and Drawings at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. After completing her BA in art history with honors at Bowdoin, Shelley earned her MA degree from the Williams College graduate program in the history of art. We are pleased to have her expertise represented today on the Bowdoin College um, Museum of Art Advisory Council. Andrew Walker has led the Eamon Carter Museum of American Art as its executive director since 2011. Prior to that, he served as assistant director for curatorial affairs at the St. Louis Art Museum. Having received his PhD in art history from the University of Pennsylvania, Andrew has nonetheless credited his dedication to art history to his education here at Bowdoin, telling a recent interviewer, and I quote, I started the journey to being the executive director of the Eamon Carter during a freshman seminar at Bowdoin College. My art history professor gave a moving lecture on Michelangelo's fresco, The Last Judgment. Not only was I moved emotionally by my professor's words, but a fire burned that perhaps I could make a living inspired by the great bursts of creativity across time. We, were, we look forward to hearing this afternoon about the extraordinary creative accomplishments of each of our speakers. And I ask you to join me in welcoming Brian Fariso, Shelley Langdale, and Andrew Walker back to their alma mater. Thank you. Well, thank you, Anne, and I want to congratulate you and Frank. Um, from uh, my perspective out on the other coast and seeing Anne and Frank at our conferences, they have really energized this institution, so a big thanks to you. It's also a great pleasure to see uh, Catherine Watson here, the past director of the Portland uh, uh, Bowdoin College Museum of Art. And uh, you know, our, our field is strong and our field is, uh, is, is made that way because I think of the people involved. So great to see you. Thank you for the invitation. Good to be with Andrew and, uh, and Shelley today. Uh, I'm gonna take a quick jaunt about a little bit. I wanna touch on two things. One is, what do the liberal arts mean to me and how did it affect my life here at Bowdoin? And it's a little bit more unusual, so bear with me. And then I wanna talk a little bit about you know, where I'm trying to go with my museum and maybe stimulate some conversation. Because it is a really important moment uh, in the history of museums and where we are. The world is changing, as we all know. It's a significant time uh, politically, economically, and I think also culturally, and art museums have to play a significant role, if not a leading role, in that. So uh, let me first start, again, with this image. This is the embrace by Egon Schiele from 1917. It's at the Belvedere in uh, Vienna, Austria. Um, I put this image up there because I was mostly a person in the studio side of art at Bowdoin. I would take studio classes consistently. And I remember my freshman year, Mark Wetley, the professor, who I know is, I believe, still teaching, showed portraits of Egon Schiele's and figurative work by Schiele, and my life was transformed. So for Andrew's point of seeing a Michelangelo, this was the artist who transformed my life. I had never seen such expression. I had never seen such pain, but also the human existence in such a contorted, expressive way. And when Mark showed me an image of, of Egon Schiele's work, I then said, this is a world that I need to commit to. Um, it was very intense. What I also took away from that moment, and what's very special about Bowdoin, and in particular the liberal arts experience here, I didn't realize that that studio class counted just as much as my economics class. And I was like, this is heaven. This is heaven. 
you mean I get one credit for art class and I get one credit for economics and they all count? And they said yes. And I said, this is the place for me. And I think it's really important to understand that because it's not like that at every school. And so, you know, as we walk around campus, as we move around this campus, um, I remember those days in January as well as somewhat in the fall, a day like this, but mostly January. And the Walker Art Center, uh, a des designed by uh, McKim, Mead, and White, 1894, which we're here to celebrate, um, was of a prominent prem prem uh, uh, presence on, cam on campus here. And next to it, as you know, when we're in this building by Edward Larrabee Barnes from 1975, the Visual Arts Center, I kept passing by these buildings. And I was looking, and someone started saying, yes, Brian, they are in dialogue. They are having a relationship. And I put this image up there because there is no doubt about it that when we think about the liberal arts and we think about our experience here in college and especially at Bowdoin, there is not only the classes we take, but it is the architecture. It is the sense of place. It is the campus. All of those things were impacting me in a profound way, and I didn't even realize it. I was absolutely fascinated over the years by the Visual Arts Center and what it meant and the proportions and the relationship it had with the Alt Walker Art Center. Uh, and to this day, I'm still um, mesmerized by that relationship. Um, another aspect of my life here that I think is of significance, this is Pickard Field. Actually, I, I should talk to the alumni or the, the college. We don't have great uh, images on the internet of Pickard Field. This is the best one I could find. It's okay, it's not great. I spent a lot of time at Pickard Field. I played rugby and I played lacrosse, and I wanna talk about that. And the reason this is significant for me is because if you spend time on campus but also at our fields, there is such beauty surrounding you. And I remember every single day being out on those practice fields and looking at the sunsets, looking at the trees, looking at the landscape and meandering back to campus and moving throughout these spaces. And it had a profound effect on me. This idea that nature, sense of place, architecture, art classes, art history, music classes, economics, all coming together was of great significance. Um, we all know the main coast. And I applaud Bowdoin, Bowdoin for ex really pushing forward and moving the campus and understanding of the coast for this community. It's of great, um, it was a great pleasure for me to be part of the ocean and to see the ocean and to have it, have it so prevalent here is, uh, I think, really quite significant. The other part was Bowdoin Rugby. I've got my ex-coach here, uh, Rick Scala. Rick, thank you for coming. There's a player here, Ben Wu. Um, you know, this was a program and continues to be a program, and it's all part of the Bowdoin experience where we create camaraderie, we create relationships, we understand what team works, we understand what resilience is, we understand what hard work is, and we create relationships, relationships that will last a lifetime. So as I was in Pickard Field, moving in and out of um, my practices, coming back to campus, this was of great significance to me, and it continues to be. It was all part of my um, growth, I think, and understanding of what a liberal arts um, um, experience should and can be. And I encourage everyone, if you're a student here, take advantage of those opportunities. Um, ultimately, after Bowdoin, I ended up studying uh, painting, leaving my economics degree behind, and I became a painter with Frank Mason of the Art Students League. This is a picture of Frank giving a crit critique in his uh, Vermont barn. He, he taught us up in, um, in Stowe, Vermont, and it was just a real honor for me to work with him, but also what made it so special is Frank gave me the license that you could fully emerge yourself in the arts make a career out of the arts. The arts were a discipline of significance and of consequence and of importance. Um, from there, I became an art teacher. I continued to landscape paint. Uh, this is a painting that I did um, about 20 years ago in the south of France. Um, I was very committed to painting and to this day, still have my paint box, although I don't have the amount of time that I wish I did to uh, paint. But it was something that was very transformative and foundational to my uh, perception vision and experiences with the arts and in art museums for the 21st century. Now, let me shift real quickly to um, art museums 
in, in today. And I want to talk a little bit about this. We, we discuss this in the field a lot. Um, I know Andrew and Frank and Anne um, think about this a lot. You know, the museums were founded with this idea that we were repository for collections, that museums were here to um, preserve the past and collect objects. Very much a 19th century idea, very much even going further back to the, um, the founding of what the museums were in Greek and Roman society. Uh, ultimately, however, where we are today, museums have transformed, I think, into something that has three parts, people, programs, and collections. None of them more significant than the other. They're all taking of, on of great importance. And we need to think about museums today in a way that position them to understand the people, not only within the museum, but who visit the museum, and the programs, and the relationship to the collections that they have. And all of our museums are transforming in this way. Our spaces are transforming. Um, we need to think about the museums that serve our communities in these ways, that the, the collections are in service of the people and the programs. And it's something that we're working on a lot at my museum. Um, also, this idea of bringing forward an expanded art historical canon. Um, I think that's of great importance. And I want to just mention this because, again, if there's any questions, this is a show we are opening up next week. This is Hank Willis Thomas, perhaps one of the most significant working artists today of the 20th century, exploring issues around the commodification of athletes um, and branding and how popular culture imagery impacts us. Um, I put this image up there again because um, Hank is someone that I think we as institutions need to really um, embrace because he has challenged us to think in new ways. This is an image from 2003. It's called Basketball and Chain. And we can see the imagery and we understand the history of, of many different aspects. There was a wonderful Kara Walker in the Art Purposes show. Kara Walker is also exploring these issues around slavery. The, uh, the issues around the African-American experience, and this continues to this day, and I think Hank hits us hard with this. Here's an another image from 2003 that uh, Hank did. It's called Branded. Um, ironic that I am showing this in the town where Nike is in Portland, Oregon. I don't know what the backlash will be showing this image, but I think it says a very important part of what the society that we live in today, of what is happening, the commodification of athletes as well as branding and how it impacts our life. So I put these images up there just to emphasize the point because Anne asked us to comment a little bit the role of expanding the canon. The canon is being expanded here at Bowdoin, I know that. We as leaders of our institutions need to continue to expand that canon. Uh, history has been uh, presented and told in a very narrow way and it's very important for us to change that narrative. I think another interesting aspect, and the Bowdoin College Museum of Art, I think, did this already to some degree, is creating a museum that's accessible for all. I put this image up there. This is a proposal for our museum to create a new entry. Uh, this is a $100 million project that we are embarking on. We are at about $50 million as I speak. Um, it, is a, uh, it is a project that really embraces this idea of accessibility. And what do I mean by that? It's about making a museum that embraces universal design, making access for all, making sure that anyone with any ability can move through the spaces in an equal way. No one is stigmatized. So what that means, as you can see in this image, um, there is the access for people who perhaps are in a mobile device on the left, or if you move upstairs, all entering in the same location. Museums need to embrace this. They need to be accessible for all. They need to understand what universal design is. But they also need to have spaces for the programmatic and people elements. This structure, as you can see, is very transparent. It's about an invitation. It's about showing art from uh, the street to understand that the museum is about art, people, and access. We're really excited about that. And my final slide is this, because we're naming the pavilion after Mark Rothko. Mark Rothko moved to Portland, Oregon when he was in sixth grade um, from Devinks, Russia, spent his childhood there, um, grew up there. He has over 50 relatives uh, who still reside in Portland, Oregon. And um, we were able to secure an anonymous gift to name our new pavilion after Mark Rothko. And I put that up there because um, this idea about philanthropy, and I think it could be an exploration for our conversation, is 
how does philanthropy work in the 21st century? And it's very complicated, but I think there is something very special. If we can name more spaces after artists, I think that's the way to go. We're trying to do that in Portland. I leave you with that. It's an honor to be back here with you. Anne and Frank, thank you for the invitation. Well, thank you, um, Anne and Frank, also, for having me here today. And that's really interesting to hear your perspectives as well and on the current state of um, the arts and, and what you, the impact was for you and your Bowdoin experience. I've been thinking about this um, a lot lately, actually, not because of this talk or coming here, but because um, just the work that I've been doing has been bringing me back to what started my interest in art history. Um, I had come to Bowdoin to be a lawyer, and I was going to take government and history, which had wonderful classes with terrific professors. Um, Professor Howell, in particular, was um, of great note, a former president of the college. And then someone persuaded me, oh, you know, take art history. And I didn't even know art history existed um, when I was in high school. And I'm like, oh, that sounds kind of interesting. And so I took Susan Wagner's um, Art History 101 class, and she is here or was here. Um, and um, I uh, was like, wow, this is really blowing my mind that you could learn about other places in history and what happened through visual means and not just reading a really fat textbook. And, um, and it really came alive for me in a whole different way that was very exciting and compelling. And I, um, you know, further as I went on through my uh, years here at Bowdoin and was taking classes with excellent professors in English and literature and um, and art history and all kinds of different disciplines because at that time we had no requirements. So we were very free to, to experiment, which I always appreciated. Um, and what was really, um, I discovered later, had been really instilled in me through all of my experiences um, working at the museum with Catherine Watson, um, as well as uh, the courses that I took was in a funny way the mission of the college um, that really led me to want to pursue working in art museums. Um, and I know you've heard it many times, but I am gonna read it because I think that um, it has a lot to do with what Brian was discussing and what I hope we can discuss more today. Oh, and I should have changed my slides. Excuse me for a second. How do I do that? Ah, there we go. That's right, we put them all together. So, um, I'm going to read the offer, the offer of the college. Um, to count nature a familiar acquaintance and art an intimate friend, going directly to some of what Brian shared. To gain a standard for the appreci appreciation of others' work and the criticism of your own. To carry the keys of the world's library in your pocket and feel its resources behind you in whatever task you undertake. To make hosts of friends who are to be leaders in all walks of life to lose yourself in generous enthusiasms and incorporate with others and cooperate with others for common ends. And I think that what has been increasingly um, concerning to me um, in the world and its changing moment is the lack of interest and concern with common good that was really expressed in these words. And one of the things that always excited me about working in museums was how to excite that sense of wonder in people and how to uh, help them discover things that maybe they didn't know about that changed their view. Um, and so one of the things that um, you know, always struck me was how, in a way, pictures and visual uh, culture could, if you presented it right and could tell interesting stories, uh, convey in a, more, in a less intimidating way some of these ideas and, and sharing perspectives. So I wanted to, um, this is a painting from one of the first museums that I worked in, which I'm sure many of you know well, from the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, Paul Gauguin's famous, where do we come from, what are we, and where are we going? And in a way, I think that is a question that um, you can almost take to any picture or exhibition that you look at, because I think it offers you some insights into that. Um, one of the things that I wanted to, um, you know, that I've been really thinking about 
in addition to sort of how do we break down canons, how do we bring in new perspectives, how do we expand audiences um, in this moment when we're sort of revisiting the canon, revisiting ideas of authority, whose authority, um, whose point of view are you representing? There, you know, we're sort of breaking away from there's a particular point of view. And that's exciting to me because I think that a lot of people, um, particularly in some of the institutions that I work for, you, one might even make the argument about the McKim, Mead, and White building, that it can be intimidating. It's a, it has a very classical, regal kind of look for it. And I think Brian's thoughts about sort of opening it up visually and physically opening up space, making it feel inviting and comfortable is something that we're all thinking a lot more about these days. Um, and there was a very interesting um, article in the Art News um, in July in which an interviewer spoke with my new director at the National Gallery, Kaylin Feldman, um, and a gentleman, uh, a public interest lawyer, Brian Stevenson, who's the founder and executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative, and who some of you may know just recently was involved in the opening of the Legacy Museum and the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama. So two very different kinds of institutions, one very fine art focused, one more socially focused. Um, but what was interesting was how they both really talked a lot about what is the role of any museum um, in, in terms of their job working with objects, be it objects or ideas. And I think a lot of us now are thinking very carefully about rather than curating a thing, curating an experience. And what we're trying to do is help people, um, you know, think about what does it mean to be human? What, what historically, how what's our relationship to history? Uh, what's our relationship and how do we think about ideas of beauty? Um, what, um, how do we think about uh, achievement and standards? Um, it's a really, it's a much more question asking um, than authoritative telling approach um, that I think we're all beginning to explore more. And um, so I urge, if any of you are interested, I urge you to read that um, dialogue because I found it very compelling and, and thought provoking. And just um, last week, there was a, a preview of uh, the Museum of Modern Art is about to open their galleries after a huge expansion, another expansion, their second in 20 years. Um, and there was an interesting uh, discussion by Sebastian Smee, who's a, a reporter for the Washington Post, talking about that how extraordinary it is that MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, who has always been sort of the demarcator of the canon of what modernism is and what's, who are the important artists and what are the developments of modernism over time, um, has really abandoned that. Um, and they have worked across departments, so they've People working with prints and drawings or working with the architecture curators, and they're completely transforming the kinds of stories and presentations that they're showing. They're planning to rotate their collections much more frequently to show art that isn't normally on view. Um, they're opening with two exhibitions of works by African American artists and a featured show of a recent collection of Latinx um, work that was donated to the collection. Um, and the fact that MoMA is doing this is really, I think, um, acknowledging a sea change in the way museums have started to think about uh, projects that they're working on. So um, I'm just going to sort of share with you, um, having said that and sharing with you a little bit about where my head's been, um, some of the projects and things I've been engaged with in pondering some of these questions. And um, one of the things that uh, has been happening in a lot of institutions is there's been a lot of sort of exploring new ways to find, uh, to help museum curators work together. And when I was at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, we actually put together a group um, called the Contemporary Caucus. So anybody who had anything to do with works of art that were modern or contemporary would meet and we um, regularly to talk about what could be new strategies for collecting across the institution. Because you might um, not realize from the outside, but oftentimes uh, curatorial departments end up being very hierarchical, separate fiefdoms. Um, and so there's a famous story 
um, where the Met, at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where the African art department wanted to buy a work by uh, the contemporary artist El Anatsui, um, who is now quite well known. And this was before he became so well known. Some of you may be familiar with his pieces. They're often sort of giant curtains made of woven metal um, uh, soda caps and things like that, and they're quite beautiful. Um, and there was, so the African art department wanted to buy this and they went to the contemporary art department and they said, no, no, we don't have the money, you know, and the African art department didn't have as much uh, purchasing funds, so they ended up buying a modest, a more modest Anatsui, and then five years later, the contemporary department bought a giant one. Um, and so, you know, this is, so this is the kind of thing that we were trying to avoid. Um, and so it was, it was a very fruitful project because what we started to do was we started to go around together. We even, you know, shared different perspectives, different artists that we knew. And then we decided to have, um, organize a conference where we brought in people from outside, artists as well as um, curators um, and uh, critical thinkers to explore three different topics that might help us uh, rethink our strategies. And so the conferences, that we organized, I organized one and my colleagues organized two others, were looking at art across geography, looking at art across media, and looking at art across history. And so, um, as often is the case, I don't know why Princeton, curator, Princeton Drawings curators tend to be the media-focused people, but um, that fell to me. So I worked on art across media, and one of the artists that I featured is this fascinating artist named Wal Shockey. Um, who is probably best known for his film trilogy, Cabaret Crusades, from 2010 to 2015, in which he explores um, the subject of the Crusades from the 11th to 13th century uh, through the um, Middle Eastern perspective. And he worked with film. He, in the film, the actors were marionettes that you're seeing here that he would often display with the film. He incorporated wood reliefs into some of his um, installations when he showed the film, as well as drawings. So he really, what was so fascinating to me was how he was mining and looking back at historical ways of portraying the same subject. And, and, and presenting it in a very contemporary fashion. And, and at a moment when similar Middle Eastern strife uh, was occurring and uh, allowed you to think about history in a new way. Um, one of the other projects um, that I'm working on and that there's been a lot of discussion about lately, of course, is um, the representation of women artists in various museum collections. And roughly, and Brian and Andy can kick in if I'm, if I'm misremembering the uh, percentages, but roughly, most museums have about 10% are, women, are works by women artists. Um, another fascinating part for, about that is that Often, because of the nature of things, women often worked in drawing and embroidery and other modes that are uh, often uh, delicate when exposed to light, so they're not on permanent view all the time. So that creates an even smaller amount that's actually on view in the galleries for people to see all the time. That's changing somewhat with contemporary, um, but it's still part of the issue. So in honor of um, the ratification of the uh, 19... Uh, 19 Amendment um, uh, for the women's right to vote, the National Gallery is weaving through um, the permanent collection, calling out uh, the many incredible women donors um, and funding that, um, uh, that account for a, quite an enormous amount of the collection and works that are on view and that have been acquired by the gallery, as well as women artists. And one of the interesting uh, things that popped up as people were working on this um, project is that the very first object by a woman to come into the gallery in the early 1940s was the work you see on the left by Beatrice Whistler, Whistler James McNeil Whistler's wife, um, but it came into the gallery as James McNeil Whistler because someone had scratched out Mrs. on the back, um, and in fact it was done long enough ago that it was uh, held in his memorial exhibition earlier in the century as Whistler. Um, and so that's a very, I think, telling 
um, you know, part of the story of what has happened sometimes in terms of women being left out um, of the discussion and uh, shoved to the side. So it's now reattributed and that will be um, included in the exhibition. Another uh, interesting story that popped up was this Mary Cassatt, well known to many from 1905. Um, and I'm not gonna give you the full, you have to come see the show. I won't give you the full discourse on the new interpretation um, of all of this, but one key aspect of the a new interpretation is the uh, inclusion of the sunflower, and the title is Woman with Sunflower. It's from circa 1905. And I put up um, a sunflower button from the suffragist movement at the moment saying, I, we want to vote for president in 1904. So you can, and there is other very compelling evidence to show that this was an expression of uh, Cassatt's alignment with suffragist interests. Um, I'm just gonna run through quickly to just give you sort of the full range of kinds of issues that we're grappling with. Um, another issue that came up related to this project of trying to showcase works by women um, and underrepresented groups in the museum is a cache of um, uh, gouache drawings by Native Americans in the 30s um, who were working in the San Aldefonso uh, school of Art in Santa Fe that were basically being promoted and encouraged to produce works for a tourist market, for a white collector's patronage market. And um, they were given to the Corcoran Museum of Art by a woman named Amelia White, who was one of the people who were um, very involved in Pueblo Indian rights, um, but also one of the people uh, who now, there's been some criticism about to what extent she was involved in exploiting these artists as well. The other issue with these is that, and I'm showing you two relatively neutral ones, um, but there has been a lot of pushback from the Pueblo, Navajo, and Hopi, and other um, Indian communities about displaying these works because they, other examples show ritual dances and things that are not to be seen. Um, so what do you do? <laughs> How do you, you're, you, we're working in ways of trying to showcase and show, and there's certainly kind of other kinds of artifacts. How can we show these works in a context that would be appropriate and um, informative um, for people to understand the history behind them? They're quite beautifully executed. Um, and then the last from, um, this project that I wanted to show you is a very recent gift, um, a work by Anne Hamilton that was given in honor of Kaywin Feldman, our first female director of the National Gallery. Um, and this is a project from a digital print that was part of a series that grew out of a project that Anne Hamilton did for um, the Guggenheim Museum that some of you may have seen called Human Carriage. Um, it was in an exhibition called The Third Mine, American Artists Contemplate Asia. And following the curatorial theme of the exhibition, human carriage responded to the forms by which cultural knowledge is transmitted using cross-section books made from multiple volumes um, and stitched together. So physical alignments were made between disparate texts to demonstrate the possibilities for meanings that can occur when a work in translation circulates in uh, culture far from its origins. And what she did to make this print was she took the stacks of books that she had in her installation, put them on a scanner to record them, and then manipulated them um, in her, uh, in the final um, inkjet print. I like this one in particular because I think it, um, to me, it calls to mind um, the Tower of Babel. And then last, um, I just wanted to share with you the last project I did um, at the Philadelphia Museum of Art was an exhibition of the work of a late 19th century Japanese artist, um, Tsukioka Yoshitoshi, um, who was often regarded as sort of the last great master of Japanese woodblock prints. And I found him an intriguing character to look at in this moment. A, because he wasn't so well known. It was a moment in our exhibition schedule at the museum where um, we did not, we had a lot of work by Western artists. So I thought it was a moment, that, an important moment to showcase part of the collection that was non-Western. Um, and 
uh, Yoshitoshi himself was so fascinating because he came of age in 1860 just as Japan was opening to the West and really had to grapple with what it meant to modernize and hold on to your cultural traditions. And I think he was a particularly interesting um, artist to look at um, at this moment in our own culture as there's an increase in nationalism and as sort of um, holding on um, to what people feel is a sense of danger of losing um, one's culture or fear of losing one's culture. And um, I think Yoshitoshi was a fascinating example of how he explored that through um, adapting Western modes of uh, space and, and contemporary subject matter. And yet in the end, I'll show you, these are, um, I'll pause to just say these are two uh, prints that he made for newspapers, which were new in Japan at that moment. Um, and that was completely unheard of um, at that point to have a contemporary event shown Everything was always uh, a historical subject because the shogunate that had um, run the country up to that point in time forbade any contemporary image to be shown. So this was part of the modernization that would have been really shocking um, to the audiences. And there's a woman on the left in her girl power moment throwing off two men who tried to rape her. Um, that was a story reported in the newspaper. And then on the right, um, there's a story, uh, a news story of a ghost who visited a carpenter's wife. But in the end, Yoshitoshi was able to really synthesize and distill the best aspects or the most you know, um, inherent aspects of Japanese woodcut in terms of color and simplification of composition and love of pattern and a certain flatness and then strategically incorporate aspects of space to create these incredibly beautiful works. Um, that are, have these sort of suspended moments of animation right before a certain action is going to take place so you don't know when what's going to happen in this story. This is a famous story of a battle between a famous um, uh, shogun on the left, um, a warrior who was trying to collect 1,000 spears. Um, and if he collected all, all 1,000 spear tips um, and melted them into a new spear tip, it was supposed to be invincible. And he'd gotten up to 999 when this young 13-year-old um, samurai came along and defeated him. But we don't know at this moment which way it's going to go. And it looks very, very modern and very, um, it was very inspirational to anime and contemporary um, artists working in Japan. And this is just one of his other late works where you see that same kind of beautiful synthesis of specificity um, and um, beautiful design. And then lastly, I just wanted to say that, you know, in, the, um, in our concern and rightful concern and interest in expanding canons and, um, you know, better representing underrepresented groups and audiences in our institutions, we still have important um, you know, artists within the canon um, that we, you know, need to attend to in terms of our collections and we need to figure out how we can best continue to represent them and create dialogues with them um, and other new ideas that we're bringing in. And one of the things that um, I inherited when I walked into the National Gallery four months ago was a recent, relatively recent acquisition of 1,700 Jasper Johns proofs for his prints. Um, that I am now exploring how I can make more accessible to the public. So that was a very whirlwind tour of um, all the many kinds of issues um, that one um, is dealing with today. But I think, you know, as I said at the beginning, I mean, what really, you know, drives me and, and the thing that I feel in the back of my mind every day is, you know, how can I construct programs and exhibitions and make acquisitions that will have an impact on people that will help them understand each other better, um, think about the world differently and more cohesively and, and more broadly, um, and really for um, ultimately for the sake of the common good. So thank you. That was brilliant, I thought. Thanks, Shelley. Brian, um, they're hard acts to follow, uh, so I will, I will be um, powerfully brief. 
um, in my comments. And you know what struck me in what both Shelley and Brian have hit upon with my experience at Bowdoin, and don't leave Suzanne, you can't leave yet. Um, it, in my experience at Bowdoin, does anybody want to guess who that professor was that Anne quoted? Who may be here or have a memory of 1987? It was uh, Professor Olds, um, who uh, sadly has left our presence um, in the last few years, I believe it was. But there was a moving moment. But it was different than his skill at lecturing, which, were, which often was like poetry, which I deeply appreciated. But it was also part of a, what was called a freshman seminar. Do they still do that here? And I can't tell you how important that was as a young kid from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, coming to Maine. I'd never been to the campus, actually, when I arrived here um, with my you know, steamer trunk off of People's Express, was that in that period of that session, that seminar, that first semester, there was validation of what the, was possible um, in, the, in the world of the mind, in the liberal arts education. Because that's what I needed to hear. I had n totally nerdy expectations and interests as I came to this school. And in that first seminar, because I could put sentences together and I looked closely, Professor Olds believed in me enough to say, yes, anything is possible. You, you can do anything you want. You know, you're going to have to work your ass off, but you can do anything you want. And that translated for me into working with Susan Wagner. Susan, are you still here? Um, boy, she had to put up with me talking about Botticelli for, oh my gosh, I don't know how long that was. But um, it translated into the professorship. Um, so it divided for me, excuse me, from the academics to the museum. So it was Suzanne, it was Brian Lukasher. I don't know if any of you remember him. He was here briefly um, and then supplanted by Linda Doherty. Those are really the three um, people of the mind that um, demonstrated that, that art mattered in the sense of its ability to tell stories and in its um, opportunity to find expression for me, to be able to tell those stories through my own uh, template of language um, in a way that was important and valid. And, you know, I, I just, I still remember that senior thesis, um, and I still have it, you know, interestingly enough. And it generated, and this, I can go on, and I probably talk all about Bowdoin and nothing about what I'm doing now, but I still remember how that work translated into my work in Ray, Ray Boutin's poetry, or not poetry, drama classes for one-act playwriting. Because I wrote about Botticelli as a, I mean, I don't know if you remember this, but I created an entire one-act play around a painting that I was writing my senior thesis on. And it's that kind of networking, that sense of possibility that this school gave to me in that period of time. And it really also um, happened at the museum. So I worked for Jose Ribas, who's in the audience tonight. Uh, Suzanne Bergermont was a great friend. and and. Catherine Watson was a mentor, really, to demonstrate that, you know, you can actually run a museum <laughs> that is, it is a profession. It's actually valid, because I know when I went to school, people were like, what do you mean art history? What do you want to do that for? What are you going to do? You should be a chemist. And I was like, well, I, I would fail every one of those um, chemistry classes, and I didn't want to do that. Or I would have gotten, what, a pass, right, <laughs> in our day, um, before they, when they still did not have grades. But um, let me see if I got this right. So I'm going to generate. So in the time that I worked in the museum, it was about the relationships that were built, the friendships that, that were um, demonstrated, and the professional practice that I learned um, from Catherine, from Suzanne, and from Jose in those periods of time. But it was also about realizing I was always a very visual person. Um, and I used to spend, when I was growing up in Pittsburgh, every Saturday at the Carnegie, because my mom would go down to do a poetry class and I would wander the scape. So I was comfortable with the idea that art had a meaningful structure in your daily life. I told you I was a nerd. So as a, you know, as a, a sophomore in high school, that's where I would spend my Saturdays. And so when I came into the, the BCMA, right, as we called it back then, but the Bowdoin College Museum of Art, um, I began to attach to particular works. And I just wanted to share two. One is the Martin Johnson Heat Approaching Storm. Um, to me, this was the most mysterious, um, effervescent, 
uh, expression of, of um, the world's environment that I had ever seen before. And I still um, get chills looking at that rainstorm that's crossing a, across the plain right here in Ma right near here in Massachusetts, right? And it was interesting that as I took my first real professional job at the Art Institute of Chicago, one of the first acquisitions that I was able to manage through the process was the purchase of a Martin Johnson Heat, of a picture in York, Maine, actually of all places. But I don't know if this makes sense, but that impression and that sense of commitment um, that I experienced in looking at a work like this carried forward for me. And I just, you know, ended up deciding to study American art as my doctorate um, and associating with the American field in the uh, profession of museums um, from a very early age because of works of art like this. Um, and again, they're rooted in history. That's a kind of a thread of what I wanted to say today. But I also love this. I would spend hours looking at what we called Sodom and Gomorrah, or Lot, Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah, I think it's been retitled by the master of somebody, I don't know. Sorry, Susan, I've forgotten all of these details. But, um, but the point of this being is there was a kind of majesty, a sense of wonder, to your point in the work, and there was a quality of universal kind of, for me at that point in my life, um, there was a kind of universal sense of, of shared purpose, right? Um, whether it's in the danger of uh, what's happening in the particular work, but it was more as it was manifest in the environment of the landscape. That just took me by, um, by you know, literally took my breath away. And, um, you know, the coloration and all the way, all of the things that the Northern tradition in the Renaissance was manifesting. But it was also about storytelling. It, and that, to me, has been something that is critical in the museum culture of today, which is, and it can be across the realm of, of descriptive work, but pictures, whether they're in the biography of the artist or the experience of the individual or um, the actual narrative within the work, they're all telling stories. And in many respects, just like the relationships that I made with people here, that creates a sense of depth and significance that is shared, I've, I have found, um, and is important to the evolution of museum culture in this particular day and age. So I wanted to shift just a little bit now to, I mean, my journey was broad and relatively broad and expansive from here. Um, uh, I, I was great, gracious, grateful enough to have a summer position in, at the Bowdoin College Museum of Art at, when I graduated, which was transitioning me. And I think it was Catherine that told me, because I, well, I wanted to work in a museum right away, and I wanted to live in Brooklyn, right? Those were my, like, two dreams. So I... It was what Catherine encouraged me was, you know, be real, but also be persistent. And I must have called Linda Ferber, who was then the chief curator at the Brooklyn Museum, every week to see if they needed someone. And I think eventually it was just like, oh, just give him something so he will stop calling us. But that was my avenue into the professional world as an undergraduate. And I have to say, having an undergraduate degree only gets you so far. Um, depending on what your ambition wa is. And I was determined to make a career out of museum work um, at that, uh, even at that early time. And so I went down to Brooklyn, worked in two jobs, um, but I was working in American museums, or museum, American department at the Brooklyn Museum and a museum in Jersey City that was devoted principally to American, both historical and contemporary work. And so I was kind of setting a mold, right? And that has led me you know, to a deeper understanding of what the purposefulness of the story within the American, you know, our national culture anyway. Um, but, of course, it's many, many related connections to um, the global field uh, in, in, in important ways. But I, I was in uh, Brooklyn for a while, went to graduate school in Philadelphia, was at the Chicago Art Institute, the, the uh, museum um, in St. Louis called the St. Louis Art Museum, where I moved from curatorial to managerial. I became an assistant director at that phase and therefore um, had made a decisive decision, right? I was moving out of the curatorial ranks, um, which is what I, where I thought I would always be. And you saw in Sh Shelley's passionate presentation today, like what richness and what opportunity, how lucky are we 
to be able to unpack cultures through their visual expression often and bring those to a, re a relationship to our communities. And so important what you said, that it's not about telling people what to believe or think about these experiences, but it's about creating the richest, most widely accessible experience such that people can make up their own decision about what it means. Um, and that has been kind of a guiding mission as I've been a museum director now for almost nine years at the at the um, Eamon Carter Museum of American Art. Now, right, I had the privilege from moving from an encyclopedic museum where I had to get in line when I wanted to do an American project um, in regards to exhibitions uh, to uh, being able to direct a museum that was holistically about American, the American experience. And, and this is where I hadn't thought about this until we were all just talking today was that there, there's a sense of its alignment with Bowdoin that is very different than all of the other places and relationships and people that um, I've, I've made along the way that have been meaningful to my growth and my hopefully my well-being. Um, and that is that, th th that in a university environment, as you have here, there is that intersection between museum and the mind that is, that is given opportunity, if not privilege, right? It's a great moment to be really ex in a liberal arts institution, especially to be exploring the depth of field that you can actually experience. And I said here, I never believed that it wasn't possible. And I, I, there was something that happened, I think it when Jose, you might remember this, um, in my junior or senior year, that we started a group called Where For Art. Were you part of that, Shelley? An event, and what that was, was just like some crazy idea of a bunch of academics as well as artists getting together and saying, we can um, create a pop-up. It was really a pop-up experience. It would happen in um, the library, which I'm forgetting the name right now. Um, yes, in the, main, in the downstairs area of the library where we would hang pictures by, living, by artists that were part of the, the college community, I think expressively. But why I say that is when I think about what's happening at the Eamon Carter right now, um, there's a couple of things that we've been doing. One is, to the point that Brian brought up, was there's a real sense about the environment of, this, of the museum. You've dealt with it here, right? That, that leads to transparency and opportunity. Um, and it manifests in the physical structures of the institutions that we work on. The Eamon Carter was, is a Philip Johnson multiple decade um, um, program. Uh, it was uh, the desire of the founder, a uh, powerful woman, who actually was the first trustee at the National Gallery, the first woman trustee at the National Gallery in Washington. Her name was uh, Ruth Carter Stevenson, and she passed away in 2013. But from the, her early 30, or her mid 30s until her death, she ran and built this museum for the city of Fort Worth. And the belief that she had was. Um, was about accessibility, and it was about being free and open for everyone. It's something that's been at core for the Eamon Carter. But she was also trying to build a story through the collection that was comprehensive. So we have this collection of valuable works of art um, in paintings and sculpture especially, but then we have the, the second largest American photography collection in the country, which many people don't realize. And we have a works on paper collection that is around 15,000. So modest in comparison to the NGA, but nonetheless, for this institution in, in northern Texas, it's significant. Um, and we have a library of 150,000 items that includes archives that creates a campus, right? It creates that experience that I had here within a single institution. There's a, a professor um, who's in Dallas now a man named Rick Bertel, who is well known in the field of uh, modern French studies, certainly, but he's just a force of nature in general. And he's, he, he will say to anyone that the Eamon Carter is the only institution in Texas where you could start and finish a dissertation. And why I say that is, in the same sense of possibility that I learned here, that the Carter is beginning to, uh, to build upon that reputation that had been long established in our DNA. And remember, I'm just humbled by 125 years right here at Bowdoin. Um, you know, we're 60 years old. We're a young, we're a young institution in a city that, that you can actually touch the founding generations by two, right? 
So you can't do that in Maine very often. You have to go a few more generations until you're at the root. But in Texas, it's a much different kind of experience sometimes um, in that regard. And so we've gone through this new rebranding and renovation that has been about the issues that Brian brought up, I thought, beautifully in his presentation, which is about accessibility and experience. Um, it is a, the fundaments of the, of, the, of the industry right now is interested in diversity, access, inclusion, and accessibility. And those are words that you're going to hear a lot about because it is at the root of the notion of changing a canon while still understanding that the canon's significant. Right? How do you do that? And especially, how do you begin to build that in a, in a museum that, as mine is, is largely hyster his hysterical. It, is a, it can be hysterical, but um, that is largely historical. Because right? there's really something about expanding it and adding to a canon when you're dealing with the contemporary that's, that tracks very differently when you're dealing with history. And, and that's something we maybe could discuss um, in, in later. But what we did was um, bring to bear in this renovation um, amenities that we didn't have in the galleries before. This, we used to have carpeting and a blank, a kind of acoustic ceiling. I mean, think about it, this is Philip Johnson building, so it was beautiful in its own realm. But it didn't allow, in many respects, for the sense of um, clarity and openness, larger rooms, uh, galleries. Um, and so what we decided to do was gut the whole floor and go back really to the vision that, that um, Philip Johnson had, which was bringing you know, the what I call the kind of refinement of wood floors and um, a completely innovated ceiling that uh, mimics skylight using LED technology. Um, so that you have this sense, which Philip Johnson always wanted for this building, um, a really clean, light across all of the galleries, which have now grown to be much larger, even though the footprint didn't change, um, sim simply the design of that, of that space. So before, it was like an envelope that went around a central core. Now it is a room-to-room-to-room -to -room -to -room space, such that those um, are bringing opportunity to build experiences to our audiences in ways that are matching at least what we feel um, will deepen. We also did a lot of front-end study. To, to see where, oops, oh, let me go back. To see where people, this is kind of fascinating. I never would have, this is one thing I didn't learn about, <laughs> which was a real interest in the visitor service side of the operation to understand what people's patterns were of movement, right? So we found that there were areas of the museum's building that people got to at 20% versus other um, um, flow-throughs that would get as, you know, as high as 85 to 95 percent. And the question was, are we doing something wrong, or is there a way that we can fix that through redesign? That's a large um, notion about why we change the galleries, what we do, because now you have to go through every space. You don't have to go look for a space or pass by a space, given the the, um, the logic of the way that architecture is reinforcing the notion that we want people to have the richest possible experience as they can have. So that's just an indicator here. Another thing that we've done, and I was so impressed to see um, Glenn Ligon's The Runaway series that you all have in the exhibition right now, we've been able to take our historic sensibility and bring in this notion of diversity and access um, and canon changing by putting in dialogue within a historic gallery um, these notions of con more contemporary issues, because we believe firmly and are reinforcing it in our vision at the Eamon Carter that history matters only as much as it relates to our contemporary lives. And so part of the way of doing that is creating conversational moments within the permanent galleries where you break out of a chronology or a narrative and you introduce a subject through a contemporary intervention. And we happen to be using Glenn Ligon in our early uh, American galleries to, to help frame that. As you see, all of a sudden, you're looking at uh, a Henry Inman native portrait, and then you confront um, Glenn Ligon's historical um, piece around the runway. Um, we are, we've opened our exhibition uh, with uh, this, ex this show, which was organized by the National Gallery of Art. This world is so small <laughs> in many regards. 
um, because the Shelley's colleagues have put together a very significant uh, piece on Gordon Parks. I think Philip Bookman has, has curated it. And he is an intimate, I'm sure, Frank, uh, of yours and of our curator of photography in Fort Worth as well. So there's a, a kind of commonality of opportunity. But for us, in a, a largely, um, a very diverse city, but a city that is largely Hispanic when you think about its, its minority population. But in the notion of breaking the canon, or at least expanding the canon, it has to do oftentimes with what we can present also in special exhibitions. So Gordon Parks is certainly part of our collection, but to be able to explore the 1940s work. Now, this is before um, uh, the period in which many of you may know his work, um, although his most important picture was uh, that's there, American Gothic, um, that's there was part of work that he did for the FSA. I believe it was the FSA. And, um, um, but, you know, when I do tours of this now that it's open, and I ask people what their sense and uh, identity with um, um, Parks is, it's, uh, many times it's around the film Shaft, right? Have you seen Shaft, the original 1971? I think it was 71, where he was the, both the cinematographer but also the director. And so this work really was the work from the 1940s established a reputation for Parks that allowed him, in many respects, because of his tenacity and his sense of injustice in the professional world, 1940s is Jim Crow America, um, um, that allowed him to grow towards that reputation that he could be a Hollywood filmmaker um, in the 1970s. Uh, so that's all to say this has been a part and parcel of a, the Carter's commitment to look at um, in uh, the, especially the black American contribution to American creativity um, over a series of years in which we either sponsor or organize or partners with institutions that are, are developing exhibitions. Not to mention the growth of our own collection within different ways. And what I wanna say somewhat provocatively in thinking about the canon and the issue of diversity is that we're very, um, we're very committed in two ways um, and I think there are important questions that are happening within the field that, that the notion of diversity is not just binary. So we've done exhibitions in the last couple of years that have been Lebanese American, Pakistani American, that have looked at the Latina, Latina X world, Latino X world, um, as well as the um, black American world, um, and, and understanding that there's a, a sense of, um, the greatness of diversity in this country by the breadth. And it's not for every institution, and certainly not with my colleagues here, but there can be a, a binary sensibility that happens and that comes out in the profession that we want to simply acknowledge, but also to say canon thinking is not binary. It can, in other words, black and white. It can uh, look more broadly at um, communities that make up this country. And one way that we manifest that differently than collections based is when we get to program. If it's people, collection, and program, Brian is absolutely right that you have to look at that as a network that is commonly working towards the larger purpose of the institution. So quick two things that we've done recently, just as examples outside of the collection, is that we've established a program of Carter Community Artists. Now for many museums, this might seem simple, but for the Amon Carter, who's always been rooted in its history, we've had a very um, complicated relationship with the living artist world, because oftentimes there's the association of the artists getting the, repu getting the validation of the institution, right? We show you, you're somehow great. And that's a tricky business for us. So what we've done, because artists are talented in so many ways, is that we've created a residency where four artists um, interviewed and selected from the regional community come and work for us for a year. And they work on programs, they go out into the community, they develop art projects with people of all ages um, that is making an impact and it, it is suggesting actually that relationship is not about what you do all the time, but it's how you show up for the world. And I found that artists, and you can see, um, in the, in the selection, Christopher Blay, Diane Durant, Lauren Cross, and Arnaldo Hurtado, we have a, a wide array that, of embracing what we would consider our commitment to diversity, um, not because of who they are, but of their talent. And um, additionally, 
uh, they've been able to bring intuitive problem solving to the museum. I mean, I would love to have, I wouldn't, I would, yeah, I would love to have a group of artists always on staff because they bring a sense of creativity because they're constantly problem solving um, in the making of their work and the uh, develop. And I've, I've noticed that many artists are really exceptional um, cooks as well because it's a similar task of actually having to create something unique and individual out of a, out of a, um, un, an unprototyped problem. And then finally, this is the last thing on the community side, because I do think changing the canon is about what we do professionally inside the museum, but it's also about how we show up for our community, because everything feeds the same goal. And what my team has done recently in education, we've realized that we kind of got the inside okay. We're pretty good at that. In other words, if you come to choose to visit us or through school work, that we are going to meet you at your place. But we've been taking the museum to the street more and more. And not just in a, in a and this is so important to the, 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 my team, not just once or twice. This is about a sustainable long-term goal. And what this map represents are the community centers that we're reaching out to that are matching, by and large, the city council districts for the entire city of Fort Worth. So those are 16. We're in 13 of those areas, and the, the, the staff the, our group, our educational team, as well as others, visit those 13 institutions 20, at least 26 times a year. And that might be showing up for a city council or for a, a community meeting, um, or it might be developing a program. But what it demonstrates and what we've seen and can kind of chart and measure is that the consistency and sustainability of that relationship brings a deeper relationship. Brian Stevenson talks about proximity as power, the person from the Peace and Justice um, Center in Montgomery. And we're finding that that manifests itself in true terms. And why that's important is, I think canon changing is as much about, you, and you said it too, Shelley, audience changing, as it is about buying a work by you know, somebody of, of a diverse or underrepresented background in the collection. And if you can do them simultaneously, there's a sense of purposefulness, success, in my, in my opinion. And, the, and I would just live by that notion of sustainability. And what's interesting is that notion of collection, history, challenging ideas, engagement with the living world is everything I was able to do at Bowdoin. I mean, I wasn't the boss. Catherine was. <laughs> and I promise you, I, I made sure that my work was done on time for Susan. <laughs> but um, the, the notion that it was possible to participate in all of those elements in a way that you weren't patronized, um, you weren't diminished, and that you could take that notion and innovate at the same time um, was everything I did at Bowdoin and is everything I'm trying to do today. So thanks. So I just want to start by thanking our panelists for three extraordinary and very inspiring presentations. Thank, thank you all. And I think that they have each given us um, a significant amount of food for thought. I know that I'm bursting with, with questions, and you may even have questions for one another. And we can, we can certainly think about going in that direction. But I also know we have a very distinguished audience with us um, this evening. And so I think I'd like to actually start by opening our conversation right now um, with the audience and inviting questions, responses, um, reflections. And I'm going to ask everybody, if you don't mind, to use a microphone um, so that we can, we can hear you clearly. Thank you. I thrill at hearing from each of you your common and individual 
initiative, energy, and uh, interest in reaching out beyond the walls of the museum, and I don't mean just the physical walls, but the metaphorical walls of what museums we typically consider to embrace. And I'd like to hear your reflections on the way in which that kind of information, which by no means is always nonverbal or visual, because it includes dance and various other forms of expression, with the largely, and this is a cruel generalization, academic focus on evidentiary knowledge and the pursuit and testing of knowledge, whether it's for the archaeologist, what's retrieved from the historical physical record, or whether it's the, the verbal primary and secondary source that becomes the focus of much of academic pursuit, particularly at higher education. So you are, I believe, at the forefront of how you bring those two worlds together. And I think there's been a lot of development over the last few decades, and I witnessed to several of them, <laughs> as to how you see that evolution progressing and what you see in the future of what we can accomplish by bringing those two different kinds of knowledge together. One, how do you boil things down succinctly to a kind of a common understanding that is both flexible enough and ambitious enough to embrace the contrary, as well as the other that profoundly and exuberantly celebrates the multiplicity of interpretation. I'm not taking that one first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll go for it. Um, a couple, I think a couple of things. I mean, one, well, yeah, right, exactly. Um, no, I mean, I, there, there are a couple of, of responses I have to that. One is that, you know, I think not always in my career, I have always thought, and what I have been most interested in is the, and I don't think we talk about it enough, is the dialogue that we create in our juxtapositions and in our selections of works within exhibitions. Um, there's so much discussion about labels and who's writing the labels and who's editing the labels and interpretation, but I think that gets missed and it shouldn't because um, I think really carefully about placement of works and, and the conversations that I'm creating between works of art on the wall. Um, and I think we've gotten better about inviting different people to participate in tours of exhibitions and things like that. But, but going to your other point, I don't know if you're um, aware, because I, I'm not sure many people are aware, that there, when there was the big scandal about Chuck Close in the hashtag Me Too movement, the National Gallery was in a position where they, they um, did not open the show that they were planning. However, the Pennsylvania Academy um, of Fine Arts in Philadelphia already had it on the walls already had a show on the walls. And instead of closing down the show um, or you know, having some other reaction to it, what they did was they pulled things from their collection um, that often did have a political content or an opposing kind of view to that discussion. Um, they happened to have um, thanks to um, a private donor and a tremendous collection of work by women artists, many of whom were feminists. And so they were able to quickly put up an exhibition that kind of responded to those issues. So that's one interesting way I think um, it's easier for smaller, more nimble institutions to do than large ones. Um, but I think you may be seeing more of that kind of response. I don't know if you guys have. Yeah. I. I think it's a really important question, and I think it's a question I think about all the time. I work a lot with our curators on this point, and um, I think it's really about an end statement. So what I mean by that, it's not either or. Mm -hmm. So the academic world, the world where maybe people are not immersed into the, or the, the language or the histories or perhaps the research, um, that's okay. And so what we need to do is to be that bridge. And, and when I say an end statement, so I talk to the curators a lot about 
It's the questions that you're asking around the objects. It's the questions you're asking around the content versus um, making sure that you're um, sharing that encyclopedic knowledge about that object. And it's really about question, uh, problematizing, contextualizing, and thinking critically about those works. And then also using those questions to make them accessible for a broader audi audience. I don't think we figured it out yet, to be honest, too, in a certain sense. Because um, what Brian's saying is really important, which is the sh there is a shift from telling to asking. But there's also a responsibility, right, to, to a certain sense of knowledge because it pushes you or pushes you, it has the potential to push an individual into a different level of self-awareness, one would hope, right? And what I said earlier about storytelling, I'm still a big, that there feels like a piece to that as a position that can help guide those questions to a, a greater depth of understanding without losing the, let's say, the reality of fact um, as it relates to creative expression. What I've seen, and, and, and I'll just give one brief example to the interpretation level that Shelley's pointing towards is, we've, we've recently, in the reopening, developed uh, you know, just another way to access information. Like you have those listening guides here at the, at the museum that um, you can code in your phone. And it's not a curator. It's, you know, we, have, we show these oil dregs by an artist from, from the Texas region, a man named um, George Grammer, and it's a guy who was on the oral. He was a it was a roughnecker who's giving his point of view of looking at this work, and it's all, so totally different than I would as an academic, you know, would write about. But it adds to an understanding that I wouldn't be able to find in any book or archive, um, but only by somebody who says this is what this brings to me. And so the hope is spurring people to have similar experiences. The other thing I would say is just this immersive sensibility that's changing not only the way exhibitions are being designed, but the opportunity for mostly living artists to um, present different kinds of um, experiences. So we have a, a digital work on view, and trust me, this is totally brand new for the Emin Carter of a woman, of, a, of, of, of an artist who's in California, and it's all kinesthetic. You, It's an algorithm that she's written that's permanent on the on the wall, but as you move through this space, you add to it, and it it captures your movement, translated into line, stays there for a while, and then disappears. And that, and I can tell you, uh, the four-year-old ballerinas that have been to the Amon Carter in the last couple of months have been astounding. But there is this notion of participation that adds to, and I think reinforces the point that you're getting to. I just don't know what it's going to look like to be quite honest. I, like, I just wanted to add one thing. I mean, I think, you know, on the other hand, one of the biggest challenges, I think particularly in this moment, is we don't want to abandon a sense of fact. I think, I think there has been a danger and some, you know, it's good to experiment and it's good to fail because that's how we learn. But I think sometimes this idea that, you know, absolutely any interpretation is, is right. Um, you don't want to discourage people from having their own responses and everybody brings their own baggage and things like that. But at the same time, it, it's, a tr it's a slippery slope. And I mean, it was interesting. There was um, Oliver Lee Jackson, um, a contemporary painter from St. Louis, was speaking at the National Gallery the other week. And he talked about how, you know, how he thought about his paintings, how he executed, but then they go out in the world and he doesn't have any control anymore. And, you know, and there's always that, aspect of, of it. So I think it's a, it, you know, it's a fine line to navigate in sort of providing context and um, information so people can, you know, have an informed um, experience without dictating. And I think that's, that's where we are. <laughs> yeah, thank you each for those um, thoughtful responses to a really interesting um, question and challenge within the museum field. Are there other questions? Hi, thank you all for coming. Um, it's great to hear 
um, your perspectives on returning to Bowdoin and how it's sort of still played a role throughout your life in shaping your passions and your work um, in the museums. And um, I had a question that's been on my mind recently um, about the transparency and salary worksheets that um, spreadsheets that were launched and shared over the summer. Uh, and if you had any personal thoughts on those and um, how your institutions are responding to um, this issue that's coming to light. This is question. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a really good question. It's about transparency and salaries of museum workers and I'm all for it. I think it's a really, really good um, process that started and you know, showing more light, shining more light on you know, there's some real disparities in the field. And uh, the field has traditionally um, functioned in a way that this idea that it should be an honor for you to be able to work there so we can pay you much less. And ultimately, that has its repercussions. Um, and if we are really committed to a profession, but also to inclusion and diversity, it's all related, um, we need to pay our interns. I don't know if you pay your interns here. We just at AMD passed that we want to pay all of our interns. We want to have salary structures that are reflective of, of, of how to move this forward. Um, easier said than done, because you're talking about big numbers and shifting. And we've, at my museum, ever since I've arrived, we've dedicated about a quarter of a million dollars a year in trying to just invest in more salary equity, um, more and more. And it just keep, we just keep pushing ahead and, and trying to move forward. I, I think it's great. I, I think, I agree. I think transparency is essential because the alter, what's the alternative? I mean, it is a way to spin your staff into um, behavior that's, that is, is not intended, if, if you know what I mean. So if there's a question about validity, I guarantee you there'll be 20 stories that end up by the end of the day that are trafficking through any institution if it's an, is important of a topic as you know, justifiable and equitable um, compensation within, within the museum. And my experience is museums are pretty responsive to that disparity um, um, as a matter of responsibility to the board. That's what I've seen. So there's a, because, and you probably know this from those articles, but I don't know, Brian, what it is at Portland, but for the Amon Carter, it is, of our operating budget, salaries and, and benefits make up what, 75% probably, more we're, or less? We're at 55. But. So there's a, you know, there's a big portion of your activity that relates to the you know, equitable, hopefully, of compensation of your staff. In other words, your, the way that you're doing um, wages. Uh, so we, we, need to, we need to be responsible to that in a variety of ways. And part of that is equitable payment and we, we, we have a process of always weighing it against the information that's provided to the industry. So we do it through um, larger consultants of an HR firm that are able to mark what the salaries are within the city, right, within various grades. Um, and everything is graded. I don't know if you know this, but every person's position is graded such that there are what they call quartiles or quarters of increase to match what that grade would represent. Um, and that's informed by local and national and industry standards. So there's a, there's a, there's a quality out there. And if you're a responsible institution, you'll, you'll, you'll play within the lines, right, more or less, um, and try to be justified just, just to those individuals on your staff that um, may fall outside the line for a variety of different reasons that are too too detailed to get into here, but it's important. I love when that, when people, when you, when people do things like this was not, this was somewhat controversial, that make you uncomfortable, you're right where you belong. <laughs> um, well, I'm not a director, so I don't have the same kind of insights um, and, and control or influence um, about that, but um, I, have to say that, and I know this is not true of, of Andrew and Brian, but in my experience, since I've been in the field for a couple of decades now, I have definitely um, experienced not necessarily so much solid um, salary disparity, but um, definitely not been able to rise like a man would through the ranks. 
Um, so I've definitely felt that as a woman, I have been short shrifted enough over time um, that I am behind in a way now than I might have been. It's great to see advances being made, like Anne being a director, um, Kaywin Feldman becoming the director at the National Gallery, and we just learned this morning that Katie Luber from San Antonio will be the next direct female director um, at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. So it's nice to see more women getting into those positions. But the other thing about what those, one of the reasons the salaries I low, I think, is because more women have gone into the field at across curatorial ranks and lower ranks, and that's actually held them down. Um, and so that combined with a long history of uh, from going way back of people who didn't necessarily need to make money initially going into the profession, um, and doing it more as an avocation and making money, but it wasn't a, uh, they weren't providing the main provider for their families, or they didn't have kids they had to put through college. Um, all of these factors, I think, are playing into that. So it's it's great that this has come out. And as Andy said, you know, to to have more transparency, get the information out there, so people are forced to respond. Yeah, I think that's such an important issue. And in fact, in some ways, especially as as Shelley responds and sort of puts this into a larger context of broader social, economic, and political circumstances, um, I can't help but reflect actually on some comments that um, Andrew made about his experience here. Um, and it does strike me that part of what is exciting, um, Maria, about the question you're raising is that it demonstrates the degree to which the art museum world has to be understood as part of a larger whole. And I like the fact actually that the comments that each of our speakers made kind of reminded me, in fact, of the value of a liberal arts education that I think is training students here to think about these questions in a holistic fashion, and I hope also to understand your own agency in addressing these really important topics. Um, and advocacy requires education. Um, so I, I agree, I think transparency is important. And I also just want to salute Bowdoin, um, which as an institution, um, is a leader in terms of compensating students. Um, we also compensate docents here. Um, so we're, Bowdoin as an institution, I think, really um, does its best to be very respectful of um, labor that um, supports the, the arts um, and other cultural um, uh, pursuits. I think we have time for another question. Could I be the final? This is a very naive and very simple question, but follows what you've been talking about. Your expenses, if 75% goes to salary, and it probably should be more, what about the other side of the spreadsheet? Your income, I understand that through the door is maybe 5% of what you, you're nodding, 5% <laughs> of your income. So your influential citizens, are they the ones on your boards everywhere that give you that kind of money to be equal to other institutions in your towns and cities? That's a really good question. Um, I'll just jump in. I have numbers in my mind. Our expenses are about 55% for salaries, then it's probably about 20% for museum um, operating expenses other air conditioning, and then about 25% for program collections, et cetera. So it's not a, it's not a huge number that you can move around. Um, the uh, income on admissions is about 10%. We do a little bit better. But what I want to comment on, and it's a little bit of the last slide I showed, is we are operating in a system of philanthropy. And the system of philanthropy is we can see the, the broken aspects of it and how um, it is shaping and uh, distorting certain abilities that institutions have. It happens not only in our world, it happens in the college, in the universities, and philanthropy is something that I think needs to be reviewed and really thought about in, in a critical way because our institutions, going back to the other question about salaries and other things, are all based in these systems and these structures that we've inherited, um, right or wrong, they're in place. And also, I think going back to the salary uh, point, because it, it was, I think it's so significant, I think all three of us are of a generation where we've inherited 
a thinking that was, we believe, antiquated when it comes to salaries, when it comes to transparency, when it comes to these sorts of questions, and we're trying to operate in a way that breaks those systems down, and it's really challenging. And the philanthropy is so um, difficult to convince. How do you tell someone, I just want an unrestricted gift? Yeah. It's, it is, it's very true. And I was thinking as Shelley was talking in response to your question that, um, and it happens in higher ed too, there, there's, a, there's a ceiling that's much lower, right, than a salary achievement than in the for-profit world. It's just, it's just a reality in a certain way. And so you go, you, you make some decisions with the understanding that your achievement will be based on your ambition in many regards, but that that ceiling does exist. Um, and, and I have a, a, a ex-wife who, you know, has gotten tenure at, at a university in Northern uh, Tech in North Texas recently. And like, to me, that's a surgeon salary, right? But it's not. And, and it's, a, it's a remarkable disparity um, in the way that the, the free market sets value based on people's achievement. And the museum world is not a place you would necessarily expect to get wealthy. It just it isn't, right? Yeah. The, um, on the other side, um, to your question, one thing that I find, um, and, and what, how Brian framed it with the, around the notion of philanthropy, that that is, that is where the gap is developed. In each institution, we do a five to 10 year projection so that we understand what the um, income on development or on fundraising needs to be. And you know, if you're in a campaign, it's even different, right? As far as, as, far as the pressure you're putting on the generosity of the community. And um, with the recent challenges that have come. I've been on two panels in the last four months about toxic philanthropy or about ethical philanthropy, is how do you position yourself within that narrative? Because we have been conditioned to ask questions. And, and don't get me wrong, like you know your board for sure, or they wouldn't be there. It's not always simply that they have a gigantic wallet. Um, that, wouldn't, that wouldn't work. It just wouldn't work. It has to be about interest and engagement. And, but we don't always, as professional staff members, ask all of the questions. So I have a friend in Fort Worth who is an associate with the museum, and he does forensic, he does forensic uh, background work for high-level executives. In other words, I want to invest with you. I will hire my person to investigate you to make sure you're not a crook, right? And I was like, maybe, are we getting to a place where we have to engage that kind of oversight before we actually approve a board member? And I, couldn't, I can't imagine this system would work. I just, like from this position, it's hard to, for me to imagine that anyone would ever say yes to being on a board. And so it's a very, it's a paradoxical situation right now. I think, personally, I think it will even out in the short term. But, uh, you know, if I'm proven wrong, I apologize. Um, well, just I think this goes to philanthropy, but just to take it back um, a step a little bit, you know, one of the things that I think is very parallel to liberal arts colleges and our um, missions at the moment is also relevancy. How do we how do we underscore our relevancy because that's part of the philanthropic philanthropic picture as well. Um, and you know, in the in the eighties and early nineties, you could almost get you just had to say, oh. Goya, we're gonna do a Goya show. Okay, Goya company who makes beans and rice and things like that. We'll just get them to you know support it. Um, that's gone. That is gone. I mean, they, they, that kind of of um, you know corporate support just really does not exist like it used to. That's been a huge change um, in funding for museums. But what you know, I think going back to the other issues that we've been talking about today, one of the things that hasn't been brought up is that. Um, another avenue that has been starting to be increasingly explored is working with medical students oh, yeah. um, and training for policemen and detectives because what's been discovered is that visual acuity 
um, in fact, is vitally important and has been lapsing in medical students in terms of like just visually analyzing the patients before them. Um, who knows if it's attributed to learning on the computer or what all is involved, but it's, we have been more, in Philadelphia, I worked very closely with our education department and medical students. So I think as we broaden, if the more ways we can find cross-disciplinary relevancy um, to cultural institutions are, hopefully we can expand our, our, philanthropy, our philanthropic sources. Well, thank you all for these really um, terrific, thought-provoking responses. Um, as we um, close on this wonderful topic and really important topic of philanthropy, I want to thank each of you for your support of the museum, for being here with us this evening. Um, I also want to thank each of you for everything that you do for Bowdoin. Um, we're grateful to Shelley in particular for her service on our advisory council, but also to Brian and Andrew for the extraordinary encouragement that they have provided to this museum, not only through the work they're doing um, in the field for their own institutions, but also through the great encouragement they have each offered to this museum and, and to Frank and me certainly um, as, as fellow directors. Um, but this is a tremendous community. Um, it's particularly exciting, I think, for us to see these um, wonderful leaders coming back and interacting with the leaders of tomorrow um, who are part of our student body today. So thank you all for being here, and thank you again for um, your reflections and, and sharing lessons from the field with us. <laughs> thank you.